Welcome to this webinar, uh, Being a Student During the Pandemic, the Impact of COVID-19 on Undergraduate and Graduate Student Experience. We have a really great panel and series of presentations. I wanna note that this is uh, co-sponsored by uh, the Center for Studies in Higher Education here at UC Berkeley. I guess it's here, I'm kind of here at Berkeley. And then our colleagues and uh, uh, at the University of Minnesota, which is uh, our, our collaborator uh, with the North America division of the Sura Consortium. Um, so we have supposedly over 700 participants, uh, whether they're live or not, we're not sure, but that's quite uh, an impressive uh, gathering of people. The topic obviously is uh, of importance to <laughs> many people. And uh, while it is, my understanding is we have a lot of U.S. participants, there's, there's a significant number of international participants as well. It reflects also the membership of the consortium. Um, I do want to note that there are other upcoming events at the center, webinar events, uh, um, and they are focused on the COVID impact. One is on the COVID impact on community colleges in California. Another will be kind of a general look at the national level. And then there'll be another looking at the impact of the pandemic on research activities of universities. Um, you know, it's really, we're in a really tumultuous kind of period. It's uh, all really unprecedented. You can go, go back in history, but this is a unique set of circumstances. The pandemic obviously being, uh, uh, having a huge impact on higher education, on the economy, on unemployment. I mean, it's quite a uh, disjointed uh, period. Uh, we also have the Black Lives Matter um, uh, uh, issue has come to fore again. It's been uh, uh, here in the United States and a significant force, but really has accelerated greatly. Uh, and that's a factor around uh, what how students are, are experiencing their lives and, and their education. And then, of course, we've had this week a uh, number of Supreme Court cases, including today, this morning, a uh, decision uh, on DACA uh, that has preserved the DACA for, for now and seemingly pretty significantly, maybe permanently. Uh, the DACA initiative for uh, Im uh, immigrant students in the United States. So that's really a fantastic and important uh, development and shapes the context of the student experience. Um, uh, I guess the question is, we're all wondering how students are behaving and being impacted by going online. But we're also interested, I think, in how this data from the surveys that we're going to present uh, affect uh, what's going to happen in the fall. Uh, what kind of predictive measures do we have within the survey to help us? Now, uh, I want to know before we proceed really quickly that you are, uh, the, our, our, our people watching our event are welcome to uh, and encouraged to ask questions um, uh, via the uh, chat function uh, on YouTube. And so please, uh, please be sure to uh, uh, participate and I'll be using those questions later. The format is that uh, we'll have three presentations and I'll introduce each person first. Uh, and uh, they each have 10 minutes roughly each. Then we'll go to some comments by our uh, discussants and then we'll go to an open discussion which will include the, the, the uh, questions that you offer um, online in various forums. So uh, now I'm going to uh, uh, say a few words about the consortium and then we'll go to our first presentation. Okay, so that's up. Uh, so uh, the consortium is a grouping of top tier research intensive universities uh, that do survey work largely, but we do other collaborative work. Uh, we uh, administer a census online survey generally to both undergraduate populations and a different survey at the graduate level. Uh, but we've also introduced, as you'll hear, a, uh, a topical survey uh, related directly to COVID that a number of institutions have, uh, have participated in. It's a nonprofit uh, and uh, with institutions use the data as a benchmarking uh, and down to the program level. Uh, it's, I'm very happy to say that it is, uh, um, it's actually data that's used by institutions and uh, for institutional research purposes and improvement, but also uh, we have a scholarly research side of that. Uh, I should note that I am uh, John Douglas and I am the founding principal uh, investigator of the project and I'm based here at Berkeley. Okay, next slide. Um, so uh, 
we have around uh, 47 uh, members. There's a little bit of flux in that, uh, as you can see from this uh, slide. And uh, we, this includes all the UC campuses, which we first focused and developed it there. And there are different versions of the survey. You'll find out a little bit uh, when Pamela Brown presents on UC, uh, the UC system, but you can see every campus with an undergraduate population, well now uh, potentially with a graduate population too, uh, participates in, in, the, uh, in the, or parts of the membership, or part of the consortium. Okay, so now I think uh, we're gonna move uh, quickly on to uh, Igor Chirikov to provide um, uh, kind of an overall about the COVID survey that this consortium uh, did. And Igor is the CIRU consortium director and C senior researcher here at the Center for Studies in Higher Education. And you can find out more bio information on him on the announcement uh, for, this, uh, for this event. So Igor, uh, why don't you start off? Sure, uh, thank you, John. Uh, greetings, everyone. Uh, it's my uh, great pleasure to share preliminary results from the Zero COVID-19 survey. And I would like to uh, say that this survey is a truly collaborative effort of Zero Consortium members. And I first would like to thank all campus representatives who contributed to the survey development. And to me, the major strength and value of the consortium is the ability to, uh, to respond to common challenges like COVID-19 by pulling expertise and resources uh, of its members, even in a very stressful and uncertain environment. Uh, I also, uh, a huge thanks to our fantastic survey development and administration team, both from the University of Minnesota and UC Berkeley, uh, Daniel Jones-White, Helen Horner, Chris Tesoria, Erin Tower, Bonnie Horgus, and Greg Thompson. Um, before sharing uh, the results, uh, let me say a few words about the survey itself. The survey includes five topical areas that reflect primary concerns of zero member institutions during the pandemic. And these are uh, student academic experiences and transition to remote instruction. Um, personal and family financial hardships, student health, well-being and safety, student belonging and engagement and volunteering, and education and career plans. And of course, today we won't have time to cover them all. Uh, so we will focus on three academic experiences, uh, health, well-being and safety, and student plans. Uh, this is an online survey, and of course, during the pandemic, not all students had stable access to a computer and the internet. Uh, this is why when we created the survey, we try to make it short and mobile friendly. Uh, our preliminary data shows that roughly two thirds of students completed the survey from their mobile devices and completion rate was pretty high. 94% uh, of those who started, they finished the survey. And um, uh, it's pretty equal across different types of devices. We also wanted uh, the survey to be actionable, cost-effective, and allow benchmarking of consortium member institutions as usual. Uh, thus, we created a common Qualtrics installation and some institutions administered the survey themselves. And some used our regular survey, survey vendor, uh, the Office of the Management Services at the University of Minnesota. We are providing all participation, participating institution access to an interactive tablet dashboards once uh, the data collection is finished, of course, so they can instantly inform stakeholders on their campus about the results. And uh, I would like to say that sur this survey instrument uh, is freely available to other institutions. All are welcome to use it. It is published at the CSHE website and we can send all the participants of this webinar a link later. Um, Currently, we have 10 universities in the US administering the survey. All of them are research intensive universities that reflect the consortium membership and also 15 more international institutions doing the whole survey or sections of the, of the survey in China, New Zealand, Russia, India, Japan, and Brazil. So pretty uh, global coverage at this moment. Uh, for this particular presentation, we used preliminary data from five U.S. institutions that administered a census survey to the undergraduate and graduate students from mid-May to June 11th. 
only one of them uh, actually finished data collection at this point. Uh, the rest were still in the field. And the response rate as of June 11th was uh, 7%, uh, 7 to 20% uh, to the undergraduate survey and 9 to 22% to the graduate survey, depending on the institution because they started in a different time. So I would like to stress that our results today are very preliminary, survey still in the field, but we decided to share these results now because a lot of institutions are preparing for the fall semester and may find these insights, first insights from the survey useful in their planning. We're going to host other webinars and publish policy briefs during the summer and we'll keep you posted via the Center for Studies and Higher Education mailing list. Um, now uh, to the results. Uh, there are five major takeaways from uh, the survey, both on undergraduate and graduate kind of a experience. Um, first, we see uh, major disparities in student experiences and outcomes based on uh, their demographics, social identity, prior experience with online learning and life responsibilities. Second, uh, the transition to remote instruction was generally difficult to students and they experienced more obstacles rather than benefits. Third, we see looming negative impacts of the pandemic on student mental health, uh, well-being and safety. Fourth, the experiences of undergraduate students are very similar uh, in many areas to the ones of uh, graduate and professional students. We'll tell a bit more about it. And uh, finally, uh, despite a lot of challenges and obstacles, most students value uh, the university support, the instructor support, and uh, they are likely to re-enroll next year. Um, now let's move to the details uh, about the undergraduate student experiences. Uh, I will tell about the undergraduate part and my colleague Chris Tesori at the University of Minnesota will tell about the uh, graduate part. Um, first of all, the sample, uh, our sample um, includes uh, responses from more than 22,000 students, undergraduate students, and it's a very diverse student body. Almost two thirds are female, 27 are low income or working class students. Uh, race and ethnicity data so far reported only from two institutions, but at least for those two, uh, 29 are Asian, 7.5% of black or African American. 21% are Latinx and 36% are white students. One fourth uh, are first generation students, 79% are straight. More than one fourth of students reported uh, they had physical, mental, cognitive or learning disabilities. Uh, and finally, almost 9% of the sample are international students. I will now report top level results uh, in three areas, academic experience, health, well-being, and safety, and student plans. Start with academic experience. Two thirds of students report they are satisfied with the quality of their courses that were taught remotely during the spring term. Uh, and even more, 81% uh, are satisfied with the support they receive from their instructors. Uh, actually, uh, in the open-ended question, students wrote a lot of nice things about the instructors who went beyond their teaching responsibilities to support students. For example, one student wrote, uh, while I'm sick, uh, my professor checked in every day and asked me if I need help. Uh, and at the, same, at the same time, only 49% of students reported that they adapted well or very well to the remote instruction. And what's actually more worrisome that there are serious disparities in how students adapted. Uh, for example, black Latinx students, low income uh, and working class students were more likely to struggle in adapting to online modality. But also other students, as you see on the slide, uh, depending on their academic major, gender identity, sexual orientation, disability, care and responsibility, uh, prior experience with online learning. Um, actually, only 4% of students told us they didn't have any obstacles in their transition to remote learning. And the most common obstacles are the lack of motivation for online learning, lack of interaction with other students, inability to learn effectively in an online format, lack of access to appropriate study space, uh, and that course content uh, was not appropriate for uh, remote learning. 
when we asked students to choose what was the single most important obstacles, uh, important obstacle, uh, the majority told us that uh, it was the lack of motivation. And the second most important obstacle was inability to learn effectively online. And after that, the lack of access to appropriate study space or distracting home environment. Students uh, also reported some positive experiences associated with remote instruction, but at a much lower rate than they reported obstacles. Uh, some students had more time for their studies. Uh, some students felt uh, less stressed, were able to prepare more for their classes, and uh, felt more comfortable participating in class discussions. But again, 26% uh, of students, they didn't have any positive experiences associated with online learning. Uh, now let's move to the health and well-being uh, section. The COVID-19 pandemic uh, had a very negative impact, obviously, on student health, well-being, and safety. Uh, in the survey we used to validate its scales to screen uh, for depression disorder and generalized anxiety disorder, uh, and in our sample, 36% of students have major depressive disorder symptoms and 38% generalized anxiety disorder symptoms. Uh, the pre-pandemic rate of anxiety and depression among students varied depending on the institution, but uh, usually lower than this very worrisome numbers. Um, also, we see that these rates are much higher, sometimes twice as high among low-income students, students of color, non-binary students, transgender students, and some other student subpopulations. Um, so it seems like universities need to monitor closely student mental health to identify if there's a decline, uh, if this decline continues in the fall and beyond. And uh, uh, in addition to that, a significant number of students uh, experience problems with uh, buying food or paying for their housing. Um, and one particular reason for food and housing insecurity, obviously, is that the majority of undergraduate students relocated uh, during the pandemic. Half of them went to a location within the same state, 13% went to a different state, and 3% to another country. Uh, and as you can imagine, not all the students moved into a safe place. Uh, 10 to 15 percent of students lived uh, in a place with uh, physical, uh, emotional violence or abuse, drug or alcohol abuse, or where their identity was not respected. And again, uh, as with mental health, this number is higher among low-income students, students of color, non-binary, transgender students, and some other student subpopulations. Um, uh, for international students, safety was one of the biggest concerns. Uh, almost one fourth of them had uh, uh, concerns with instances of xenophobia, harassment, or discrimination. And uh, this rate is much higher for students from China, South Korea, and Japan, and lower from students from India, European, and Middle Eastern countries. And uh, finally, uh, a few words about the undergraduate student plans. Uh, yesterday, we published a policy brief about this at the CSHE website, and uh, it has much more details. In general, the majority of students would like to re-enroll in, in fall. 9% uh, of domestic students and 15% of international students are undecided or not re-enrolling. Uh, for domestic students who are unsure about re-enrolling uh, for the fall semester, the biggest concern uh, whether classes will be online and how the university will operate. 22% of students who have not adapted well to remote instruction are still unsure if they re-enroll. And international students worry more about safety and travel restrictions. So universities need to develop some targeted communications with these groups to address their concerns. And finally, uh, more than one third of students are still unsure whether the pandemic will delay their graduation. The level of uncertainty is higher among Latinx students, low income students, non-binary students, uh, students with disabilities, and those who have childcare responsibilities. Um, to, uh, to summarize, uh, our preliminary analysis of survey data shows that there are significant racial and socioeconomic disparities in student transition to remote learning. 
uh, negative impacts uh, on student health, well-being, and safety. Um, all, but overall, uh, students value the support they receive from uh, their universities and instructors, and the majority would like to go back to school in the fall. Uh, with that, I conclude my part and pass the presentation over to Krista, who will discuss uh, the results uh, on graduate student experiences. Thank you very let much. Let me just, just introduce Krista. Krista oh, sure. No, that's okay. Uh, Krista is the Director of Student Affairs Assessment at the uh, Office of Student Affairs at the University of Minnesota and also Assistant Director of Research and Strategic Partnerships for our North America division. We have a North America division and an international division. That's how corporate we are uh, for the Ciro Consortium. And I do want to note too is that uh, Krista has really been a prolific uh, uh, producer of research uh, related to the zero data and many journal articles and these kinds of things. So Krista. Thank you, John, and thank you, Igor. Hello, everyone. I'm Krista Soria. I, I use she, her pronouns. Before I begin, I want to acknowledge that the University of Minnesota Twin Cities is located on traditional, ancestral, and contemporary lands of indigen indigenous people. The university resides on Dakota land that was ceded in the treaties of 1837 and 1851. Uh, by acknowledging this, I acknowledge the painful history of genocide in the United States for Native, Aboriginal, and Indigenous people, and I honor and respect the many diverse tribal nations and peoples who are forcefully removed from, as well as those who are still connected to this land. I strongly advocate for higher education, researchers, practitioners, administrators, and faculty to honor the land, the original tribal occupants, and the history of the places in which we're all located. Uh, we have a responsibility to self-educate, reflect, and listen to the histories and people of our areas. And acknowledging these tribal land, uh, including these tribal land acknowledgements in our practice, uh, really reflects a sense of social justice advocacy for continuing the work of dismantling the devastating effects of settler colonialism in our society. I would also be remiss if I did not mention my positionality as somebody who lives in South Minneapolis, a mere six blocks from where George Floyd was murdered, and two blocks south of Lake Street where many of our local community shops, restaurants, and buildings were destroyed. As research policymakers, administrators, faculty, and higher education, we simply cannot look away. We must listen, learn, support, and advocate for members of Black communities, Indigenous communities, and communities of color who continue to experience the damaging effects of historical trauma, oppression, and systemic racism. Uh, for those of you who are interested in learning more about embedding equity and assessment and research practices, I encourage you to go to ACPA's uh, webinar to go website because they had a great webinar yesterday on these very topics. I'm going to be talking about graduate and professional students today, and my sample was primarily uh, cisgender females. About 80% identified as straight. About a quarter were first generation and three quarters were continuing generation, meaning that their parents had achieved a bachelor's degree or higher. The majority were also middle class and upper middle class. About a quarter had an emotional or mental health disorder or disability. Three quarters of the sample were white, but as Igor also mentioned, uh, you know, we only have race and ethnicity data from two institutions so far. It's a variable that we collect at the end of survey administration from institutions. So we've got some limitations in our knowledge of our sample. Um, and 19% uh, were international students, which is much higher um, than for the undergraduate students as well. Uh, I'm going to be sharing the same structure as Igor had shared. And so first I'll talk about students' academic experiences. Uh, about 43% had never taken an online class before the pandemic. So the majority of students, uh, at least the graduate and professional students had some experience with online classes before the move to remote learning at their campuses. 76% were satisfied with their online experience and over 88% were satisfied with the support that they received from instructors. And um, similar to some of the comments that Igor had mentioned showed up in the undergraduate uh, qualitative data, those same themes were also evident in the graduate students data too. Many were quite happy when faculty um, allowed students to um, sort of relaxed some of the, the educational requirements. The students who struggled the most with the, the area of support are those who often said that their faculty seemed to uh, be asking them to do a lot of extra busy work or kind of piling on the academic requirements. Um, and so that was troublesome and burdensome for some students. Additionally, only about 64% of students said that they adapted well to online instruction. 
Uh, as we saw with undergraduate students, there are some disparities in terms of how students adapted to online instruction. So students who had never taken an online class really struggled with the, the move to remote learning. Transgender, non-binary students, bisexual, queer, and pansexual students also did not adapt as easily to online education. The same with students with disabilities. Um, and, and by and large, I found this result to be true of all students of color, although in future analyses, we'll be sure to disaggregate those groups once we get the full data set. And then finally, low income and working class students also uh, struggled um, with adapting to uh, online learning. Uh, they also experienced um, higher rates of, of obstacles to online learning, and some of these topical areas also mimic those that showed up in the undergraduate data as well. So about 50 Five to 56 percent of students struggled with a lack of motivation for online learning and a lack of interaction and communication with other students. The lack of, of a good study space that wasn't distracting was also a major obstacle for graduate and professional students in addition to their inability to learn effectively in online formats and their belief that the course content was not appropriate for online learning. Only about 12 percent of students said that they didn't really encounter any obstacles to remote learning. Uh, we also asked the graduate students about obstacles to their degree progress, so their ability to meet the requirements necessary to complete their degrees. And again, that, that appropriate study space or distracting home environment showed up as a major obstacle to their degree progress, followed by the inability to conduct the research required to complete their degrees, their inability to attend professional conferences, and then the need to provide additional care for themselves or for a family member. And much like the undergraduates, uh, the graduate and professional students did not report a lot of positive experiences with their remote learning. Um, the most positive experiences are listed here, having more time for academics, feeling less stressed about studies, enjoying learning in an online environment. But about a third of the graduate and professional students in our sample also said that they did not really have any positive experiences with their remote learning. Uh, like Igor, I also saw really high rates of uh, clinically significant major depressive disorder symptoms and generalized anxiety disorder symptoms in our students. Compared to prior years, we also uh, included these measures in the 2017 and 2018, uh, where we sampled um, a, a lot of graduate and professional students from several schools. And we could see here that those major depressive disorder symptoms and uh, generalized anxiety disorder symptoms have really increased over time from 2017 to 2018 to 2019. And these are the highest levels that we've seen here. Uh, we also saw that a lot of students were worried that their food would run out. So there was a high degree of, of food insecurity among the graduate and professional students, in addition to students who said that they wouldn't have enough money to cover the cost of their housing. So the mental health concerns, um, food and housing insecurity were really large for students um, with regards to their overall health and well-being. I also saw, um, and this really connects with a lot of national trends uh, that we see in, in, in research and policy, but uh, there's some groups of students who had even higher rates of major depressive disorder symptoms compared to their peers. And you can see those rates reach up to about 50, close to 55% for non-binary students, 54% for transgender students. Um, and the same was also true for generalized anxiety disorders. So we see some groups here are experiencing really significantly high rates of generalized anxiety disorder symptoms compared to their peers. And here we also see that students who are caregivers of other adults had significantly higher uh, symptoms for generalized anxiety disorder as well. Unlike the undergraduate students, the majority of graduate and professional students did not relocate during the pandemic. Uh, only about 10% relocated to a location within the state or 10% to a different state. Um, but by and large, most of the students, um, you know, stayed sort of where they were at. Um, but there were still some safety concerns and these also connect with some of the, the results within the undergraduates as well. So about 10% students said that 10 of students said that it was never true or only sometimes true that they had a place to live that was free from physical or emotional abuse, drug or alcohol use, um, at, where their identity was respected or where they felt safe and protected. And uh, again, following along the lines of what we saw in the undergraduate data, there are some groups of students who had um, were, were much more likely to say that it was never true or sometimes true that they were sort of in a safe place. And those include, for instance, transgender students, genderqueer students, um, and, and queer students who 
by and large indicated about 30% of them indicated that they didn't really have a safe place to live um, with regards to their, their identity. Uh, and this is, a, again, mimics what we see in the undergraduate data. 29% of international students um, had some concerns related to xenophobia, harassment, or discrimination. Um, and then finally, with regards to future plans, uh, so uh, this is even higher than it is for undergraduates, but the majority of the graduate and professional students indicated that they will continue. For those who were undecided, they tended to name things like an uncertain financial situation. Many of the students in the sample had partners or spouses who uh, had lost their, their jobs, and so they were unsure if they were able to afford to continue. Um, and the rate is even higher of, of returning for international students at 96. Um, and then finally, uh, we also asked the graduate and professional students if they thought that the pandemic might delay the semester or term in which they intend to graduate. And this is higher than for undergraduates. So we saw that about a quarter said, yep, my, my ability to graduate is going to be delayed. Um, but about a third said that they weren't sure yet if, if the pandemic uh, would potentially delay the term that they're looking to graduate. We intend to share some more of these data. We've got um, a very nice uh, survey with lots of rich items that we'd like to share with folks. Um, and we're hoping to roll out some of these bigger themes in some of our future policy briefs, including more information about students' financial concerns, uh, really going into some more detail about students' safety and their current housing situation. Uh, we'd like to do a policy brief on international students' experiences because we had a very rich international student-specific module to better understand their experiences, more health and well-being analyses, uh, more disparate impacts, looking at students' social identities and demographic backgrounds and how those might impact their experiences. Of course, engagement, belonging, and then volunteerism and, com and community engagement as well. So we encourage you to keep an eye out for some of our future policy briefs, um, in addition to some of the research that we will continue to publish on this topic. Thanks so much, everyone. Okay, Krista, thank you so much. Uh, that was great. Um, now we're going to move to uh, Pamela Brown and her presentation related to the University of California. Uh, uh, Pamela is the Vice President of Institutional Research and Academic Planning at the UC Office of the President. That's our central office located for, this, for a 10 campus system located in Oakland. Uh, she's been there since 2013. And before that, she was at UC Berkeley as the Director of Institutional Research. I can't remember the title exactly. Academic uh, <laughs> Planning and Analysis, perhaps. You got anyway. it. <laughs> okay, uh, Pamela, off to you. Great. Uh, so the UC campuses belong to the CIRU Consortium, and we often partner in our UC Undergraduate Experience Survey on a core set of questions that we share amongst institutions. Uh, we um, launched the survey in uh, early uh, May uh, for some campuses and uh, quickly incorporated questions related to COVID-19 and the remote instruction uh, experience, along with likelihood of re-enrolling uh, in the fall. We partnered with our UQ's directors on the campus, along with the Academic Senate that was interested in conducting a survey. Uh, and so I'll share some of the results that we have. As with the CIRU surveys, uh, these the UQ survey is still out in the field. So we're doing something that we normally don't do, which is sharing preliminary results. And we've constructed a dashboard that we're sharing internally with our, our campus uh, UQ's analysts, along with uh, leadership, um, including our vice chancellors for undergraduate ed education, like Kathy Koshland, who will be speaking later on. Uh, currently, the surveys that we have has over 50,000 responses. It's a, overall a 23% response rate. Uh, for for the campuses that launched early, like the Berkeley campus, uh, we have a, a greater proportion of responses in, in the survey. Uh, UCLA and Santa Cruz, uh, they were our last two campuses to go out. Uh, and so um, their responses are growing um, and uh, we'll continue to update this and have better data uh, at a campus level. But at the system, I'll say, um, since we've updated this, uh, this dashboard over the last um, three times, it, the results are 
consistent at the system level. So I, I feel quite comfortable with it. Uh, it's also um, fairly representative of our student population. Uh, one of the main differences that we have is that the proportion of international students is slightly lower than what we uh, normally have um, with our uh, responses and reflecting the population. Uh, so we did also create some weighted responses to address um, any areas where we had uh, lower responses. But for first generation students, it's about 40%. Uh, slightly lower for Pell Grant recipients. So it, it's a pretty good reflection of um, what we uh, wanted to be able to um, represent for our students. So I'll begin where uh, my colleagues ended the presentation, which uh, one of our um, early hopes in uh, sharing uh, survey results was to get some uh, understanding about whether our continuing students would uh, re-enroll in the fall um, after having uh, the experience with remote instruction. And so after we excluded students that plan to graduate, our results are really consistent with what we saw on the undergraduate survey results uh, for um, uh, the other institutions. 91% indicated that they were planning on re-enrolling. Uh, about 1% indicated they were not. Uh, and then we had about 8% that were in the middle that uh, indicated that they were uncertain. Uh, and half of our goal in sharing this information was to understand who had more concerns about remote instruction uh, so that as we have more time over the summer period, we could make adjustments to support those students and address those concerns. So uh, when we looked at it for um, our out-of-state students, uh, particularly our domestic non-resident students, we have higher proportions that indicate that they were um, uncertain about re-enrolling. So 16% uh, for our non-resident domestic students, 11.5% uh, for um, our international. Uh, we also saw some differences when we looked at it by discipline where um, our students that were in the arts had a higher proportion that indicated that they were uncertain. Uh, and we have some other survey questions that identify some of the challenges with uh, classes that were more studio classes that I think are more difficult to try to create in a remote instruction environment. But when we looked at our Pell Grant recipients, uh, the responses that we ended up having, uh, they are slightly higher proportion uh, indicated that they were planning on re-enrolling. Um, so we saw less of those uh, concerns for um, those students. We did ask about some of the primary reasons that students were um, either uncertain or not going to be enrolling. Financial challenges were up at the top. Um, those were often uh, financial concerns for the students themselves. Uh, they might have had parents that had recently lost a job but these were things that were weighing on them for their uncertainty for the upcoming um, semester or term. Uh, then followed by health concerns, uh, either for themselves or for family members, uh, family responsibilities, and then visa uh, or travel concerns. And that's what it looked like overall for all respondents. We did provide open-ended responses about other reasons that students uh, were uncertain about re-enrolling. And when we coded those, the majority of the responses indicated uh, their uh, uncertainty was whether or not uh, we were going to continue in remote instruction uh, as uh, uh, feeding that. When we looked at different kinds of students, we look at Pell Grant recipients. Uh, the um, values shift a little bit. So financial challenges are definitely at the top of family responsibilities were a, a greater worry that they had um, compared to other students where um, health concerns fell out. If we looked at it for international students, uh, the visa and the travel concerns uh, were the top uh, reason followed them by financial. So we had a sense of who's uncertain about um, re-enrolling and then we asked questions about uh, how the effects of the COVID-19 uh, experience had on their ability to learn in this environment. We asked a range of questions that are highlighted here from access to the internet and study space, which is similar to some of the stuff that my colleagues uh, shared. The top concerns that students had were um, their ability to do well on tests and assignments. Uh, and um, Kathy can talk a little bit about some of the things that are being done to address uh, online proctoring and exams and approaches that are there. But that was a, a top concern. And then the second was their ability to learn effectively in a remote instruction environment. 
And when we looked at some of the comments related to this, it, it fell in two kinds of areas. One is uh, the remote instruction was challenging for some students, uh, but the other thing is it's challenging to do anything in uh, the middle of a pandemic. Uh, and so we could see some of those um, strains uh, about focusing, uh, being motivated to, um, to continue uh, their work while all of these other things are going on um, related to the pandemic and their families. Family, um, uh, challenges in that. Uh, when we looked at things like having access to appropriate study spaces, that was uh, less of a concern for some students, but for our Pell Grant recipients, our underrepresented first generation students, that's a greater area of concern for them. And then when we looked at having reliable access to the internet, um, there were about 15% overall, 20% uh, um, for Pell Grant recipients that were very concerned about uh, their ability to do so. Um, and I know campuses have been working working on trying to uh, address some of those areas. Uh, one other section where we asked questions were about uh, the impact that the COVID-19 uh, pandemic had had on their student experiences. And so these are the kinds of questions that we asked about commencement, um, timely graduation, uh, other areas. The top two concerns were um, worries about not being able to get a job after graduation. And again, particularly for our new generation students, that's Pell, first gen and underrepresented, uh, their concerns were greater in this area. Uh, we also saw a, a number of students that indicated that they were um, worried about being isolated um, from uh, their uh, friends. Um, and particularly for continuing students, those that have had an experience of being on campus, uh, being with other students, um, they really miss that uh, kind of interaction. Uh, and so that um, has been a, a factor that's there. We do see with um, uh, some that uh, are, are um, Pell Grant recipients, uh, their, the financial concerns fall out um, when we look at questions about their worries about being able to pay bills, um, manage expenses, um, and that kind of thing. And then uh, when we looked at things about not graduating on time, uh, there were less concerns uh, than I think some of the other survey um, responses that we heard. I do believe part of it has to do with this is affected one term, and uh, that was what they were looking at. Um, and most students, particularly those on our course campuses that transferred over uh, to putting on a new new term of classes, students actually took more courses uh, in the spring term uh, than they did the prior year. Uh, so they were, were taking more um, courses through this uh, period. The last couple things I'll share is we, we partnered with the Academic Senate on some questions about comparing their remote instruction experience to what it was like uh, being inside uh, the classroom. We asked about uh, quality and amount of interaction with faculty, with GSIs and students. Uh, and those responses about quality and amount uh, are, are relatively comparable. So when we asked for about that related to GSIs and TAs, about 17% indicated it was much worse. 38% uh, indicated it was about the same and about 2.5% indicated it was much better. We see similar responses when it comes to the quality of interaction with faculty, 17, 31% about the same and about uh, 2% um, much better. Where we saw the greatest uh, um, area of concern was interaction with other students. Um, they're definitely missing that. We had a much higher proportion indicated that it was much worse, uh, much lower proportion indicated that it was much uh, uh, about the same. Um, and then the other area where we saw um, significant uh, areas of concern were about feelings of loneliness. Uh, and so we can see, um, particularly in this period where you are not only um, managing the COVID-19 period, but you are sequestered at home, most likely um, there are um, worries about that. The last piece that I'll um, uh, put in there is uh, we did ask about overall um, uh, level of agreement about whether UC is committed to the student health and well-being during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. About 80% uh, agreed with that um, comment. Uh, when we 
looked at written responses. Um, while we do see students that, um, you know, have expressed challenges with the remote instruction environment, there was definitely appreciation for campuses taking the steps, for faculty taking the steps and GSIs to transfer the courses over into that environment um, in comparison to some of their friends uh, they didn't have the same kind of smoothish transition uh, into that environment, so there was great appreciation for that. But there is also um, great interest in being able to uh, return to the campus as soon as it is safe. Uh, and so with that, I will um, pause. Those are some of the high level um, findings we had with UQs. Thank you very much, Pamela. Um, that data is not publicly available, right? Correct. That may, but maybe later or. It will absolutely. We um, have in the UC Information Center UQ's responses, and when the campuses complete the surveys, we will publish those up there. Fantastic. As you can see, there's a really you can really drill down to different groups and levels. And I should note one of the maybe Igor said this, and I forgot, but uh, you know one of the concepts is that uh, institutions are taking these survey data and linking it with institutional data. So there's a lot of uh, incredible dynamics that one can do with the data with proper um, uh, 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 respect for uh, data privacy. So um, so now we're gonna go to a discussion, uh, discuss, our discussants, and they can speak for a period about any topic they really want to, but I think at least somewhat on everyone's minds is, uh, you know, how is this data helping institutions plan for the fall what concerns do they have about students? Uh, and, uh, you know, what one is, how many are going to actually show up and then what's going to happen? I did get one chat question, which was like, when did the survey take place? And, you know, it is a good consideration that surveys tell something about something in a moment in time, you know, uh, and I think we've had discussions of other kinds of uh, spot surveys that might, you know, be focused beyond the larger uh, Suru or UQ survey. So uh, in any case, uh, let me now uh, go to uh, uh, Kathy Koshlin, who is um, the Vice Chancellor for Undergraduate Education at UC Berkeley. She's also a professor of engineering, plus she has positions in uh, as a professor in the environmental health sciences in the public school in the School of Public Health here at Berkeley, and a professor in Energy and Resource Group. <laughs> so she has you have many titles, <laughs> but uh, I will say uh, she's been in this role uh, on under, undergraduate education at Berkeley for some time, and and it's really there are real tremendous innovations being done uh, by her office and by the campus generally. So now, uh, so I'll go to Kathy, and then when you're done, Kathy, I'll uh, go to Scott and do a short intro. Great. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I, I think all of us across the, the country in higher education are struggling with um, the planning for the fall. It's an unprecedented um, time. As our chancellor says, um, she feels like she's just continually driving through Tule fog, which if you live in California, you know what Tule fog is. Um, you can't see anything. Um, sort of like a whiteout on the mountains. Um, and uh, your, your typical navigation posts um, things like UQ surveys um, are only uh, going to help us up to a degree. And I think John's comment about the moment in time, we're actually about to launch another survey about our students, um, probably the first week of July, um, to build on what they've already told us in, in the UQ survey to see, okay, now that you know that the majority of your classes are going to be taught um, through remote means um, with a limited number of in-person experiences, assuming that the public health department allows us to do that, um, what are your plans? And um, I, I think we're all struggling with the, the trade-offs between uh, our, our students' um, needs for a, an experience that is not what they're currently having. So sheltering in place at home with your family might be okay for a period of time, but we all know that many of them are ready for something different. And I think we're struggling with that balance of welcoming them back, what that means as they come from wherever they've been, um, how you reintegrate them into the campus in a safe way in terms of, of um, the, the COVID-19 infection. And what you're balancing that, I, I think it's sobering to look at the um, data that the panelists just shared on loneliness and isolation and mental health. And so you're balancing, you know, public health concerned around a pandemic 
but you're equally concerned about an epidemic of, of um, depression and anxiety and um, those related things and how we as a community, as communities address some of this is, is, uh, is a serious matter. And I think layered on that now and the reflection of the Black Lives Matter um, movement, the recognition of the disparate impacts of COVID-19 that has just illuminated the, the, the disparities in our, in our society um, adds to that, that concern. One of the great things about higher education um, is it, it, it does provide a pathway to changing that dynamic. It does provide a way to creating a more equitable environment. And so denying students ask, access to that um, even for good reason, um, just makes it even more challenging. So I'll just say that as a larger context in which we're all trying to plan. Um, at Berkeley, we're very quickly um, deciding which courses can be in person. We'll have that done by the beginning of July. We will probably allow students to um, make some changes in their enrollment. Um, we are you know, anticipating new students. We're creating a um, having bar borrowed from my, my colleague, Carolyn Thomas at UC Davis, uh, where they had the idea of a quarter in the cloud, we're, we're creating a semester in the cloud, which is a curated set of courses that have many more really true online components than simply the, the movement of, of remote, movement to remote instruction. And I actually wanna make that distinction because what we all did in the spring, whether we were a semester campus or a quarter campus, was simply move our usual teaching into a remote means. And very few courses were really developed as you would a true online, thoughtfully, pedagogically driven experience. We are putting resources at Berkeley into a series of courses that will be this semester in the cloud, which will have much more of that structure with strong pedagogy and, and intent in terms of what that online experience will be. We also have about 300 graduate students who are going to be participating in a remote instruction fellows program this summer um, where they, um, they will be getting uh, an eight week course in training on how to teach effectively remotely. And they will be then able to assist our faculty in what they're doing. And then the faculty that are doing the semester in the cloud are also, also have a graduate student um, assistant working with them. So they will be developing their own sort of muscle in this, in this space. And I think it's really important to make that distinction that what we did in the spring and the results about that are going to be very different, we hope, in the fall. We won't be there yet. We won't have nailed this completely, but I think we will be in, in a much better position to deliver quality education um, in the fall, whether we're doing it on the ground or, or through digital um, technologies. And I'll stop there. Okay, Kathy, thanks very much. Um, uh, you know, I do wanna encourage people to use the chat function uh, to provide uh, questions for any of the panel members, the presentations and uh, related to the presentations and to our discussants. So please uh, do so, I'm watching them as they come in. And so now we're gonna move to uh, Scott Lanyon. And I should say that Scott has been really uh, important in uh, the development uh, and implementation of our uh, graduate student survey for the CERU Consortium. It took a long time to develop this and it's now out. And we have, I think around 15 or more institutions that are participating in that, uh, member institutions that are particip participating in that. So that's really an important uh, development for us. Uh, Scott is the uh, Vice Provost and Dean of Graduate Education at the University of Minnesota, and he's also a Professor of orth orth Orthonology, I'm not saying that right, <laughs> birds, <laughs> and so, uh, and has a long history with uh, Minnesota. Uh, uh, so, Scott, um, your turn. Oh, Scott, oh, Scott might be, uh, he told us that he was having a few issues related to his uh, internet connection. So he came in and out. We'll wait just a half a second. If not, we'll go back to Kathy. You know, uh, Kathy, at least, you know, some of this analysis, we're looking at the student side of the equation. I mean, you did talk about what kind of things the university is doing, but one of the big impacts of COVID, of course, is the financial impact or, you know, anticipated current and anticipated 
Do you see this as, as what kind of a challenge does that uh, bring up for you at Berkeley? Well, I think that the reality is, is that every institutional higher education is, is losing um, resources hand over fist. We all, um, or many of us gave refunds back to um, students when they moved out of the housing. That's millions of dollars um, in losses. And if you think about how you finance housing, you do it because you can get a loan and you build new housing and then the beds are filled and that's how you pay your debt. And the debt doesn't go away when the students aren't there. And so the, the losses in, in housing and dining revenue are significant at Berkeley and, and throughout the UC system and across the country. So that's one huge factor that's, that's looming. The second one is that um, our costs went up. So we added um, extra resources at Berkeley for remote instruction. We um, purchased um, you know, laptops and, and, and um, other peripheral devices for faculty and, and staff and students who didn't have them um, uh, or couldn't afford to buy them on their own. Um, we've intensified cleaning and are ramping up um, the costs associated with, with uh, uh, custodial <clears throat> services. Um, you know, hospital systems lost enormous revenues. Um, so the, the, the losses in the, in the UC system, I think are on the order of about, Pamela, correct me if I'm wrong, about 13 billion. That's a number that I heard. It's about $13 billion, um, which is a staggering as over 10 campuses. So you can imagine that a huge portion of that, probably half is, is losses in the medical centers. Um, and our own losses at Berkeley are, you know, we're aiming on about a two to $300 million gap um, uh, that some of which will recover fairly quickly when things come back to normal, but others of which will take two or three years to recover from. Um, so it is, it is a serious, um, Problem, and I think one one of the things that, that folks often miss is how much of what research institutions do that is not just about educating the next generation, but is also contributing to research. So, Berkeley, for example, even without a medical center, has had about three thousand um, faculty and graduate students and staff on campus working on COVID-related research. And, and one forgets how much of what we do is um, research in service of the state of the nation and the world. And that continues to go whether or not, um, you know, students are present. So, and there's costs associated with that. Um, we've had, we had donations that came in that have helped us set up our labs and do some other things, but it's, it, you know, we're an enterprise that is, is incredibly important um, to our local communities. Um, it's hard to believe, but the city of Berkeley actually wants us to come back um, for all the years that we had challenges with. with I think they call it a love hate relationship. It's a love hate relationship, right? <laughs> there's That's been good. a plea to please, please, please come back. Um, in fact, uh, there's a whole video that you can watch on YouTube uh, where the city is saying, "You know, we missed you. We missed you." <laughs> So, well, there definitely uh, is a, a pattern when uh, UC has developed new campuses <laughs> over its history, obviously, and the early there's a very strong honeymoon period. And then later on, there's a, a resource uh, and various other issues that come into play. Right. Uh, Scott kind of keeps coming in and out. We're still hopeful, Scott, that you'll, <laughs> you'll be back with us. I thought I had you there. So, John, oh. I'm here. I'm going to... I'm going to stop the video and oh, maybe okay. that'll help. That's yeah. a good idea. Yeah, that, that's, that's fine. I just asked before when we lost you for a minute, I asked Kathy about the economic impact and you know how what kind of adjustments are trying to be uh, made at Berkeley as the semester starts. But why don't you go ahead then? And I, I did introduce you. So why don't you go okay. ahead and do your, your comments? So um, what I would say is first that we um, uh, just launched our survey uh, on Monday. Um, so it's just three days after the announcement of our fall modalities. Um, the, um, and, and what our, we're doing this fall is to actually have courses uh, taught in persons and a combination of that plus uh, some um, that are being taught online and remotely and the details we haven't uh, figured out yet. Um, the results that we have at Minnesota are very similar to what Krista has already reported for graduate education more broadly. Um, and I just thought I would focus on a couple of things that I found uh, really interesting. I was very concerned that um, instructors would really pile on more work for graduate TAs. 
Um, and while I gather some of the uh, comments indicate that that happened for some students, most students were very uh, pretty satisfied with the level of support that they had from their, uh, their instructors. And so that's very reassuring to me. We have more work to do for the fall and making sure that um, the, the faculty are not uh, abusing that relationship with uh, their TAs, but in general, it's better than I feared. Um, similarly, I was very concerned that advisors would be um, uh, not uh, providing support to their students, graduate students, once they were working remotely uh, as scholars. Um, and again, while there is some indication that some students were not getting the support that they uh, deserve. In general, it seems like the level of satisfaction of graduate students was, again, higher than I thought it might be. So I'm reassured. Again, we have more work to do there um, and trying to encourage faculty uh, to do the right thing. Um, I thought that the, the, the most important is the concern of graduate students isn't really about the content of courses being delivered online. It's really about this issue that they themselves don't feel well prepared to learn in that modality. That's one, that they really miss the student interaction with their colleagues um, and that they uh, don't necessarily have the facilities at home um, to uh, to, to have effective learning locations. And so as we go back onto campus, I think that is gonna be something that we have to pay attention to, uh, making sure that students, um, even if they're teaching or taking courses remotely, that the graduate students actually have an office or places that, that on campus where they can work and be safe. Um, so I think my internet probably is still going in and out. Um, I will stop there and take questions, hopefully, um, and uh, happy to contribute. Uh, thanks, Scott. I'm, I'm looking at questions that are coming in on the chat room, but also we have uh, questions that were offered before uh, the um, webinar started. So I'm also referencing uh, some of those. I wanted to ask uh, related to one question is uh, to, uh, to Pamela is, and you mentioned this some, is that you're using some of this data to help you kind of help the campuses in the process of, of planning. Of course, there seems to be an advantage if you're in the quarter system versus the semester. Semesters are generally starting later in August and then the quarters get, at least they got a little more or more planning time. But how useful are you finding this data uh, in having that discussion with the campuses, not just Berkeley, uh, but the other campuses? Yeah, I mean, I'll say, uh, you know, Kathy leads the group of uh, undergraduate education um, vice provosts, and they've had, the, gosh, well, it was weekly meetings for a while, and now, now they're taking every other week off. Um, and I'll say through this period, uh, they're learning a lot from one another, and this data is helping inform some of the challenges that, that they've seen. So the, um, you know, the quarter campuses, uh, they had to immediately put on a new semester, a new term uh, with um, the uh, remote instruction for the um, semester campuses, they had to deal with uh, commencement and summer uh, sooner. And so now um, the semester campuses are, are in a space where they're uh, needing to make decisions on the fall um, slightly before that. So they're, they're learning from one another. I, I'd say some of these um, items that have come up uh, are ones that have been major uh, points of discussion. For example, one of the areas that was uh, highlighted there were the challenges associated with um, taking exams online. And I know uh, at Berkeley, they've done a lot of work and they've shared that with other campuses about strategies from even rethinking um, what assessment means uh, to how you do this in an environment where you're trying to protect student privacy uh, and also, um, you know, address some of those challenges uh, of uh, internet connections. Uh, you know, the students uh, in the comments indicated that they were stressed out, uh, worried that when they were taking an exam that their internet connection would fail. Uh, and so all of this information is feeding into um, some of these bigger decisions that uh, that need to be made. And I just turn it over to Kathy to see if she wants to share some of the work that's being done um, in, in those areas. 
Yeah, that's, this has been probably the, the, the most challenging um, uh, piece of things that we've been dealing with because our pro process at Berkeley was always to have um, most midterms and finals proctored. And um, you know, that, that's a deterrent for cheating. It's not a guarantee against it, but it certainly is a deterrent. And the move to online and remote um, really affected that because our, the concerns around student privacy, the fact that many of them were taking their exams in their bedrooms, um, that um, they did have unstable internet connections and were afraid that that would be interpreted as, a, as cheating as opposed to, I have an unstable internet connection. There are a lot of layers and questions around this. And, most of the, the remote proctoring tools, the services that were, were um, available in the spring were already maxed out. You couldn't actually even get a contract with a remote um, proctoring service if you wanted it. And secondly, most of the lockdown tools are easily worked around. And um, so there was no point in, in spending a lot of money on a lockdown tool that really wasn't going to be effective. So uh, we worked a lot on um, emphasizing the honor code, emphasizing the value for academic integrity, um, having conversations and classes around that, um, asking folks to sign an honor code, uh, you know, pledge before they took their exam. Um, a number of things, some of which we had in place already, but which was this was an opportunity to really elevate that. We also talked a lot with, with faculty around rethinking their exams, everything from um, writing prompts that are, that are harder for students to cheat on because you can't, you know, you have to actually do the work. Um, creating open book exams where you make clear what what you know expected there and 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 thus again um, students have a resource um, randomizing questions um, providing different kinds of exams that's that's a greater challenge for the faculty members but um, when done well can can work that creating uh, many more um, tests over time rather than relying on one high stakes final that tends to again exacerbate the the, the um, pressure for students. Um, our biggest problems are actually, we saw the biggest amount of, of failure to act with integrity were on courses that are uh, critical for um, entrance to majors that have a GPA requirement. And there's no question, and that's a self, in some ways that's a self-imposed by us. So it's on us to figure out um, some of this, as well as, again, having conversations with students about reality. The, the approach from students is, is sort of, um, especially if you're grading on a curve, that's something else we're trying to say, stop grading on curves, grade for mastery. Um, because if a student feels that they're being disadvantaged by a curve and somebody cheating and therefore getting a higher grade, at least if you're, if you're grading for mastery, um, those students might still have access, but you're not disadvantaging someone. Um, so there's a, there's, it's a multi-layered, very complicated set of questions. I don't think we've nailed it yet by any means. Um, we're working on some pilots um, where we are going to allow Zoom proctoring this summer. Um, and, and we'll see about that in, in, in the fall semester. But it, it, I think it's a major question for all of us. Um, and we don't yet have the tools, um, the appropriate tools to address the issue. Great, you know, uh, we got some really, I've got a rich tro uh, trove of uh, questions, so we'll try to get to some more. But we do, I have a number of questions related to methodology and how the survey was developed. So I'm gonna to look to Igor and Krista. And uh, the questions are, how did you develop the survey? How useful is a survey developed? One question is uh, from our uh, a colleague here uh, at the, uh, from the University of Toronto is, what use is a survey that's done before March 15th? I think most of these surveys were done after March 15th, but I'm a little, a little confused. So back on methodology, concerns about bias and the response rates, these kinds of things, either uh, both of you, uh, Igor, why don't you say a little bit how the process went about to develop the questions for the survey? Sure, uh, absolutely. Um, uh, basically, the, the survey was developed uh, based on the initiative from uh, Zero Consortium members. Uh, a few universities approached us after the survey plan for March were canceled. Uh, they asked us whether a consortium is planning to develop a, a survey on the impact of COVID-19. So uh, in a way, it was a membership-driven process where uh, members just pointed out the areas that were of primary concern to them. 
Uh, within the consortium, we have what we call design and content work group that works on the survey content and updates on, on the survey. And that group was really instrumental in, in developing the survey. Um, uh, so it was, uh, I think we, uh, we, developed in, uh, we developed the survey in the record kind of a, a few weeks. Uh, so that was really quick. Uh, and again, I'm grateful to all the members of the DCW and other campus reps even the universities that are not administering the survey actually provided a very useful input uh, on the survey instrument. So that was really helpful. As for, uh, but uh, actually I think it's a good question to what extent our instruments, you know, developed for a pre-pandemic work will work in the, in the pandemic or post-pandemic world, if, if there will be a post-pandemic world, hopefully. Um, so we, we, we need to understand better that, and there is a great deal of uncertainty how campuses will operate, not only next year, but after that, uh, will we see lectures as we had them before? Will we see other uh, elements that we got used to during this time? So that's, I think, an open question. Krista, would you like to add something? Yeah. Something that I would like to mention is that completely unsolicited, we received an email from a student who took the survey recently to say, thank you for developing a survey that thoroughly captures like my well-rounded experience during the COVID pandemic. And so it, you know, of course, like nobody is perfect. And I, I think we definitely tried to develop a, a survey that was as comprehensive um, and responsive to students' needs. And it seems as though students are also telling us that the survey, um, you know, has really captured all the multiple dimensions of their experiences during the pandemic. So we're excited about that. Um, but to Igor's point, moving forward, you know, how are we going to continue to adapt our surveys to really be, um, you know, focusing on students' current lived experiences, I think is a major question for the consortium moving forward. Well, I would say, you know, uh, we all have the problem of survey fatigue. Uh, and we do, there are surveys that perhaps we might value more than others if at, at a campus-wide level uh, or a system level. Uh, and it is important that I think we found that there's a feedback loop in some way that students not only respond because it looks like you care to some degree, but they can see the results and the campus community can in some form. So in the development of the survey question for UQs, just uh, uh, briefly, uh, uh, Pamela, how did that, how, what was that process? Uh, so it was similar. We worked with the UQ's directors on identifying a set of questions based off of the kinds of questions that they were hearing on the campus. Um, so that for sure, the piece about whether or not you were going to re-enroll was, was part of the process. Um, in the midst of it, we heard that... Um, that uh, the Academic Senate was interested in surveying students. So we quickly reached out to them and said, let's see if we can partner on it. So they asked a series of questions to faculty and, and they had um, sort of flip questions that they wanted to ask of students. So we worked with them on incorporating that into UQs and constructed a similar dashboard so that the Academic Senate, uh, the system-wide group could have access to those results uh, in, in the process that's there. And we've worked in incorporating the faculty responses with the student responses to do that. So, so there was a partnership with it. On the response, um, uh, you know, we showed you a little bit on uh, the representation of the individuals who responded to the survey. So for us, um, it's gotten much better when we we did it. We looked at results when there were 15,000, when there were 30,000, and now the 50, 50 plus. At, and can, they're relatively consistent for sure at a system level. It's getting better at campus levels, but we did provide weighted responses to try to better reflect the population in any case where um, there were differences, but, but I'll say it, it, it is pretty reflective. Uh, on, I do think, I mean, we did have a discussion at the beginning about whether or not we would launch a survey during a pandemic and what it would mean to have UQ's responses uh, at this point in time. Um, we are starting to look at some of the um, responses that are in there. For example, we asked questions about food insecurity. And when we look at that at the system level, overall, we see a decline in those that indicate that they have very low or low food uh let me make sure I get this right, food security, see if I get the proper way there, um, compared to prior administrations. When we start to dive into that and we look at Pell Grant recipients compared to non-Pell, where we see the biggest decline was, is with non-Pell recipients. So while we ask what, what it looks like over the last year, 
I'm sure that there are going to be some responses that are affected by I'm back at home and this is what it's like for me. So we'll have to kind of tease that out. Uh, so to some extent, campuses are doing a lot more in that area, so that could be part of the factor. But this this timing of when the survey is 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 another thing that we'll have to look at when we look at other responses that we've asked or questions we've asked um, over prior periods. Okay, let me, uh, there are a number of questions here about uh, the faculty and the administration and how they're handling things. And we've had some, uh, you know, answers to that or responses from Kathy and Scott. Uh, but one question relates a little bit to how prepared are faculty uh, to really be online? Uh, they went through this emergency period. And now if uh, we'll have this semi, you know, Berkeley just announced its own plan for how it's gonna open in the fall. But you know, there's always the backdrop that there may be, yes, there may be some courses, small classes that are gather. We won't have large classes. Uh, and if everything goes bad, if we have another wave, you know, we'll be going fully online. So back to the question, uh, both to Kathy and Scott, how prepared are the faculty and what, what things are being done in order to uh, get them ready for the fall, fall semester or quarter? <clears throat> Either one. So why don't you go first? Why don't you go first, Scott? All right, because I'm we lose you. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm, I'm now connected via my phone, so that's actually more reliable. Um, I think, so there's a variety of resources on campus to help faculty um, uh, prepare for this. We're actually looking at um, upgrading classrooms so that um, they can be this hybrid modality where there's some in person, but some students are choosing to connect remotely. And so that is actually, we can, are getting ready to upgrade more classrooms to be ready for that. I think that's what scares faculty the most though, is this idea of how does one teach ped, you know, pedagogically effective class in person to some students while other students are either connecting synchronously to that same presentation or that they're preparing for an asynchronous use. Um, that I think is the, the where faculty are the least well prepared and we are uh, still trying to figure out how to help faculty. I think the experiences this spring uh, really helped a lot of faculty figure out what does and does not work in a completely uh, remote teaching uh, context. Um, that's the challenge is trying to figure out how to uh, serve a combination audience, those in person and those remote. That's where the biggest challenge is, I believe. And uh, I should also say, we also have the issue, as will everyone, about um, what is uh, proper, proper physical distancing in an in-person classroom. So we're uncertain about that. We've said for the moment that it's six feet uh, and we're getting ready to figure out how to allocate classroom spaces to uh, courses on that basis, but that could change. Um, and if it does, how are we going to handle that? So that's the other um, major uncertainty in, in figuring out which classes should be in per person or which one should be remote. Sorry, go ahead, Kathy. <laughs> so, so I wanna echo what Scott said. I think this the notion of having to teach in a, in a dual modality of hybrid um, uh, is, the, is the biggest challenge for faculty and the one that we're seeing the greatest resistance to. Most faculty who um, are teaching large classes are planning to teach them 100% um, remote and not try to do a, a hybrid. Um, we have set, set a maximum of 26 people, 25 students and one instructor as a class size that we will um, work with and anything larger than that is, is likely not to happen. There's maybe one or two exceptions to that. Um, we're using the six foot um, distancing as well for laboratories and studio kinds of, of classes. Any class that really in many ways can't be done um, remotely. Um, as I said, we had a lot of experience towards the end of the spring and, and our faculty are working over the summer um, in many of them to um, further adapt their, their classes and create things. We, we are outfitting more of our classes with our new um, uh, course capture system, Kaltura, and that will be in uh, many, many rooms over the campus by, by the fall so that at least faculty could come in and use the state of the art um, uh, method for, for doing their lectures uh, rather than having to rely on their, just their laptop. Um, 
And again, the, I mentioned before the investment in the graduate student instructors uh, who will be getting a certificate for remote instruction um, if, when they complete the eight week course this summer and um, additional support for faculty in developing their classes. We have a website called Keep Teaching um, through our Center for Teaching and Learning that has a lot of information. We've obviously you know, looked at, at resources from across the country and, and have compiled things for our own um, use. We were um, lucky in some respects because of the um, fires and um, power shutdowns that the campus experienced in the fall. We had already put together a group of faculty and staff working on an instructional resilience um, guidelines and strategies for the campus that work started in December and really got serious in January. And so when we had to pivot in March, we started implementing all the all of the recommendations that we had been developing through this task force, and so it was a it was a fairly quick pivot, partly because we had already done a lot of work, and then we've been building on that with additional guidelines um, for the fall, and we're about to release another document, um, and that has been a really powerful partnership. Both of that, there's three or four task forces that I have co-chaired with our um, chair of our academic senate and have been completely um, collaborative work between our Senate and um, administrative leaders and our IT staff, our, our educational technology staff, uh, just a huge collaborative effort. I will also say that we've had a, a, a major effort around um, online advising and tutoring. And so um, units like our Student Learning Center, our Athletic Study Center, our uh, head, our, our, our manager of advisor strategy and training have all been collaboratively working to support our eight or 900 um, advisors and student affairs officers to be able to do their work effectively. And I think that's an area that we, we shouldn't forget that, that it's not just faculty and instruction that are important. It's all of our student support services and advisors who also need support and um, also have great ideas and, and are, are taking the lead in developing those. Well, related to that, I, I have a question here uh, showing some disappointment at a failure uh, for UC to provide ways for students to gather online. Are there creative ways, uh, basically now I'm off the quote, but uh, creative ways to get, uh, to provide that link? Uh, because this is this part of the, and I know you're concerned about this, both all of us, uh, but uh, how to, you know, create communities that are virtual in some way. Um, so anyway, any, any response to that question? I'll just say quickly, and then Scott can jump in here. Um, we, we're we just beginning to really have a serious conversation about what to do in this regard. I, I, you know, our priority was instruction and research. Um, now building community and student life is is really the work of, there are five of us um, uh, working on this now um, and from the administrative leadership. Um, I know the business school, for example, has used um, Slack and it's been very effective for them on um, their other sort of tools. And I think that's what we're going to be looking at is, is ways and also really talking with our students, what's working for them? How are they building community? Because they're doing it anyway. Um, you know, the, 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 the um, Blockley graduation was an amazing uh, collaborative effort of over a hundred Berkeley students who recreated um, in, in Minecraft the entire campus. Inside, I mean, Doe Library, inside and out. I mean, just incredible um, uh, collaborative effort that they did over the, the spring semester. So I, I think there are tools and things out there I think the question is, is what do we try to support? How do we help our students? And, and this is an area where we do need to talk to our students and listen to them about what works for them and what doesn't. Scott uh, and Krista, any re response to some of these questions uh, for the University of Minnesota? So at the graduate level, and I'll start there, I think that um, I would echo the idea that many of our graduate programs, the students are uh, self-organizing in whatever mechanism yeah. works best for them to create those communities. And um, obviously that is um, easier in sort of mid-sized programs. The really small programs, that's probably not working as well. And, and the really large programs, I question how effective that is. I, and I don't actually have data on that at the moment, but that's sort of the feedback we get from students. Um, that's at the program level. Um, what the graduate school is doing is trying to help um, with uh, sort of our students of color, our international students to create community for those uh, identity group uh, subpopulations. Um, and that is working and it's helpful. Um, but I 
think that we mean we may need something that's sort of intermediate that's sort of pulling together students from different identity groups from multiple gro- uh, graduate programs but in an area you know within the liberal arts for example within stem disciplines and that we have yet to really sort of experiment with Chris, any quick comments i've only got five minutes so i want to get through a couple more questions yep um at the university of minnesota with the un- undergraduate students, I think that they're also sort of self-organizing or organically um, and many of their student clubs and organizations. We also have students who developed Goldie Craft. So they developed a replica of the University of Minnesota Twin Cities campus in Minecraft as well. Um, but I believe that the persistent challenge for all of us right now is uh, balancing on the one hand, you know, Zoom fatigue, right? And, and, and all this time online and in these, you know, screened spaces. Um, and on the other hand, wanting to stay connected and involved. And, you know, um, although we're all um, sort of isolated from each other, how can we maintain those genuine human connections in a virtual space? So that is definitely something that we're all struggling with. Um, but, I, but I do believe that students have a desire for that. That connection. It's just challenging at this point in time to figure out what, what is the best avenue to provide those resources for students. And yeah, you John, know, can uh, I just, can yeah, I just quickly ahead. add, uh-huh. and I think that's going to be a challenge for all of us because as we open up our campuses, all of our students are going to want that contact. And that's going to go counter to whatever health, safety, distancing, and measures we ask them to, to practice. They really want this contact. And so that's just going to be a challenge we're all going to need to deal with. Uh, yeah, you know, uh, uh, two more questions, I think, if I got this right. So, uh, and are there are a lot of uh, things we're get, I'm getting on the chat line. Now there's about the demographic mix, makeup and differences among groups. One of the things that Igor had in his uh, brief uh, and in the analysis was at the undergraduate level, the data from the COVID survey was saying that there really wasn't a big difference among uh, lower, uh, sorry, socioeconomic groups and a few other variables. How do we explain that? Doesn't, it doesn't, doesn't seem like that would be the normal path. So that's to Igor. Igor, did you hear that? Um, I, so we see for a lot of variables, we see that there are disparities uh, based on the socioeconomic status, uh, race and ethnicity and other variables. For some reasons for plans, there is no uh, big differences uh, uh, across you know, social classes yeah, sorry, or plans, right. uh, uh, race ethnicity status. I think the same, uh, the same is true uh, is about UQ survey results that there is no, um, uh, I think two components probably. One is uh, the the alternative um, things that students can do are pretty limited at this point, and mm-hmm. uh, the students re- can receive much more support at the university at this point than elsewhere. Uh, so that's probably the major uh, kind of a reasons for students staying uh, consistently across different socioeconomic groups. Okay, and then we see in the graduate uh, the COVID graduate. Uh, survey that you know, high percentage are planning to kind of continue on with various stress levels, right, Krista? Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah okay. Yeah. And that kind of makes sense. There's a kind of different dynamic going on at the gra- at the graduate level. Okay. So I think you know we're really coming to the very ne- end here, and I like to be prompt so we don't keep people sitting online for too long. I did want to say that uh, there you know are higher attrition rates. Uh, people are dropping out of class at a higher rate obviously under this new period. And so that's kind of gonna be an interesting factor. I didn't ask that question to Kathy she, she, as to what was the attrition rate in the fall uh, out of the abnormal, what were you shaking your head? It was about the same, Kathy, is that what you're saying? Yeah, the, the withdrawal rate in spring semester was um, normal. Okay. Um, yeah. And um, and the, you know, re-enrollment, um, the re-enrollment data were, were normal when they re-enrolled in April and May. Um, I think once we've made the announcement, I, you know, we'll see what happens in the next few weeks. I think that's where we may see a shift, but up till now we haven't. I'll also say our summer sessions enrollment at Berkeley is up 55%. I mean, it is oh, staggering. Right. Yes. Um, and, yeah. and I, you know, I don't know what that'll all impact, how that will translate down the, the, down the road. They have nothing else to do. So they've chosen, and we've been very liberal in our enrollment policies and other things. So I think they are testing it out. Um, it will be a mixed experience. Some of it will be very good because um, uh, of enhanced um, online. Um, some of it will be, I think, frustrating the same way, same way it was in the in the spring. But um, we'll see what happens in the, in the end there. 
Okay. Um, well, that, that's interesting. I mean, I think there's are, at least I've seen other surveys and showing different kinds of institutional types that are having higher attrition rates and as that movement to online, but not, I understand what you, I see Pamela shaking her head, but not at UC so far. So I only wanted to conclude and, uh, and say that, you know, there are obviously uh, some limits and promises to uh, well, what we're doing as we move into this new era. And uh, we can see at least, I think to some degree, how high the value is of social interaction and ways of connecting. And that's why, you know, at least we can be hopeful that people will come back to campus even with all these unknowns. I will say though as well, we've really focused on research universities. Uh, I had a couple of questions related to CSU and to community colleges. And, you know, so we're, we're working in that kind of bubble and there are really different dynamics going on at these other institutions. And we are concerned about it. It's just that that's not something that we discussed uh, at, at this, uh, in this session. So just so you, uh, those who are out there, uh, this is uh, recorded and will be available on the center's website. I believe uh, as well, the PowerPoint presentations will be available. Is that correct, Igor? And yeah, uh, okay. And Krista, you know, uh, please kind of take a look at the center's website. We have many publications that come out if you wanna get on the mailing list uh, for events and publications. Uh, please, please do. I want to th thank our uh, participants for keeping on time and uh, I thought keeping on topic and uh, really appreciate it. And with that, oh, I, oh, I wanted to say one other thing and to thank uh, uh, Gemma Givens, who's our uh, support person at the Center for Studies in Higher Ed and helping making sure that we did this properly. So that, thank you very much.